Next page on 17, response to a seller stuck on wanting all cash. Um, if I wrote you a check for all cash today, what would you do with that money? Now that's a personal question. Some people don't want to answer that question. But if, you know, the quick answer sometimes is, oh, we put it in the bank. But, but most of the time it's more complicated than that. Either they owe somebody else some money, you know, they got to pay Uncle Charlie, or, or they owe some bills they want to pay off, they want to pay off some debts. And I've found that if you get people to list who they owe the money to, and write down the amount they owe to each of these, each, these people, that often they've exaggerated in their mind how much they owe. You know, I've had people tell me, well, we have to have 30,000 bucks, we owe 30,000 bucks. I said, well, let's, let's write down who you owe the money to. And I'll pull out a pad and we'll just write down, you know, Joe, 3,000, and we write all that stuff down. Now, if they do that, and you have a list of people they owe money to, a couple of good things can happen. What's one thing good thing can happen? You might be able to take over those debts, right? Now, if, if somebody had owed somebody money for a couple of years and hadn't paid them, how, how's the person on the other end of this transaction feel? If somebody owes you money for three years and you haven't had payments, aren't you happy to get some kind of payment? Aren't you happy to talk to somebody about getting some kind of money? So one opportunity would be to, to take a $3,000 debt that they owe somebody and, and either convert it to a, to a loan that had payments, 25 bucks a month, or just pay off the $3,000 for less money, right? Maybe $1,000 or $2,000. So if you can get people to write down a list of what they owe, you can, you can either agree to take the responsibility for those debts or agree to pay them off. And be careful what you say and what you promise you'll do. Because if you say, I'll agree to pay off these debts, make sure they understand that you want the right to negotiate these debts and maybe pay some of them off at a, at a deduction. And we, we bought a house one time from this, from this guy and, and he owed he'd an attorney in my town, 20-some thousand bucks, attorney's fees. This kid had been in a wreck and hired a lawyer to represent him or something. And, he, and I said, well, when, when was the wreck? He said, four years ago. So he owed this guy 20 grand for four years. Now, if somebody owed you 20 grand for four years and it was for fees, for services earned, at some point, don't you start thinking, not going to get paid? So I said, I'll be happy to take care of that particular one as my down payment if we can buy the house. And I was able to negotiate a, a nice discount, and it was funny because I remember calling the lawyer up and say, "Would you take?" And it was like four grand for your twenty, uh, and he said, "When can I pick up the check?" And I said, "Right now." And he walked over, wasn't very far to my office, and signed a release and picked up the check because he didn't think he'd ever see any of that money ever again. Page eighteen, negotiating one point at a time. Sellers rarely accept the first offer, and when they do, it makes you feel bad. Isn't that true? So you make an offer, they say, okay. I say, good, that wasn't good, you know. <laughs> but that rarely happens, rarely happens. And it doesn't happen with a smart person on the other side because if somebody ever makes you an offer and you're, you're tempted to take it, what should you do? You should counter a little bit anyway. Ask for something because it makes the other people feel so bad if you just say, okay. You know, you, you, they need to feel good about this deal, like they drove a hard bargain. So you just can't say, okay, ask for something. Uh, don't let them get away, but ask for something. Um, so when negotiating directly with a seller, and of course that's my first uh, choice, is always to have the seller in the room, go, go one point at a time. And uh, rather than making a, an offer, uh, when, when they set an asking price, challenge that asking price. Ask them how they came up with it. Ask them, do they have it appraised? Uh, you know, because many times people will adjust that asking price. They'll bid against themselves before you make a first offer. Uh, we just covered the next one. Make them write down things they owe money to. The next paragraph says there's a lot of things you negotiate in a house purchase. And my strategy is to negotiate things that are not as important to me early in the game. Because I want to learn how they negotiate. I want to see if they negotiate tough on every point or if they give in a lot. And if I'm going to lose, and I don't mind, it's not really a win-lose thing, but if I'm going to concede certain things, I want to concede things that are not real important to me. So a lot of things aren't important to me. I don't really know, care when we close. If they want to close this week or three weeks from now, closing day is not important to me. Stuff that comes with the house, I mean, not real important to me. It'd be nice to have a a stove, but you know, if they want to take the washer and dryer, I can live with that. Some people negotiate for everything in a house, and that's okay because it, again, it, it kind of tests 
how motivated they are. If you say, well, I, I take it if the lawnmower goes with the house, and they say, well, okay, and now you get a free lawnmower. I'm not sure what you do with it. Uh, but, but you can get a lot of stuff from people by asking for it. Um, but again, what I'm testing is their motivation, you know, by asking for stuff, testing their motivation. Uh, so at the bottom, I give you kind of a list ordered the way I would negotiate for it. Uh, closing dates, personal property, repairs sellers might make. If they're going to lease the house back from me, which happens sometimes. Now, if somebody is behind in their payments, are they a good candidate to lease a house? Probably not making payments now, they're not going to make payments to you. So if you ever do buy a house from somebody and they want to stay in a house for a while, you need to hold back a chunk of cash uh, to ensure they'll move out. And a chunk, I don't mean 500 bucks, I mean $5,000 or $10,000, you know, a lot of money. And if there's not that much money in the deal, you don't want to make the deal. So you can make a mistake by letting somebody stay in the house and promising them $1,000 when they move out and they just never move out. And if you have to go through an eviction process or foreclosure process, it'll cost you more than that. You know. Are the uh, closing date and date of possession the same thing? Sometimes they can be, but not necessarily. Because when I buy a house that's empty, I want to take possession right away yeah. before I close on it. Because I want to go there and mow the grass. I want to put my for rent sign in the front yard. Uh, and and uh, I rent almost all my houses off of signs. I don't use Craigslist or a lot of other things because my houses are neighborhoods that attract people, that are well located, and I get calls off of signs. So, but I want to do that stuff as fast as I can. Uh, and if the house is empty, I'd love to be able to show it and probably won't move somebody in, but I have done that, you know, before you close. You're not probably better for them to close on them first. But possession is, is a good thing. Um, how you will take over and pay existing debts and liens, that's real important to me because if there's existing loans against the house, I need to handle those the way that I want to handle them. And I don't like personal liability for debt, so I'm very careful about what I sign when it comes to banks. If they want to sign me to sign personally on a loan, I will do that, but only if it's a very, what I consider a very, very safe loan. I mean, if it's a $200,000 house and a $50,000 loan, I guarantee that and not lose any sleep at night. But if it's a $200,000 house and a $150,000 loan, I've seen prices move faster than that, so I would, I would be nervous about personally guaranteeing a $150,000 loan on a $200,000 house because the house could go upside down on me. So be careful about what you sign. And anytime there's banks involved, institutional lenders involved, understand the deal, write it down very carefully, and we'll, we're going to talk about that in a bit, but so, so that everybody's clear about what you're going to do. And then how much you're going to pay at closing. Uh, is that pretty important to me? Down payment's pretty important. The next page, the terms of what I might owe you are real important to me. Because we all have said, I've heard you say it in this class, that, that you will pay a higher price if you can get really good terms. And you will. It makes sense. Because the cash flow is a function of the terms, not the price. The capital gain you're going to get someday is a function of the price. If I pay $50,000 for a house instead of $40,000 for a house, I'm going to make $10,000 less when I sell it. But if I can get terms that give me more cash flow today on a $50,000 price, I'm going to go for more cash flow today. You know, if I can make an extra $100 a month because I can get better terms by paying a better price, I always go for the cash flow today because it makes the deal safer. It makes the deal safer. I can lower my rents and stay full if the market gets soft if I have, if I have lower payments. So I'm, I'm always stressing on lower payments. Um, so the terms of the loan balance you owe are real important to me. You know, if I have to guarantee it, and I don't, you know, don't have time in this class to go into all the details about the, the, uh, the advantages of purchase money notes, but in most states, if you buy a house with owner financing with a purchase money note, you don't have personal liability. You don't have a, a problem if you have to give the house back. They won't sue you and get efficiency judgment against you like a bank would. So it's a safer way to buy. But the, uh, the payment amount, the last thing on that list, the last thing we negotiate is the most important thing to me in the deal. You remember I said that earlier? We want to push up against the deadline, the most important thing to me in the deal. And if we've agreed on a price, we've agreed on the closing date, we've agreed on what goes with the house, we've agreed with who's going to do what as far as fixing the house up, we've agreed on a down payment, we've agreed on everything except the payment amount, that's what I want to negotiate last. Because the payment amount is very important to me. Okay, so you put that up to, to the end. Every point that you can agree on 
increases the chances that you'll make a deal. So there's two parts of that in there. We, we covered earlier that the more time they have invested with you, the more time they invest, increases the chances of you making a deal with them. But here, we're talking about a little bit different. We're saying the more things they agree on with you increases the chances. So if you, if you negotiated a dozen points and we've agreed on 11 out of 12, we only have one left, that puts a lot of pressure on us to make that one last deal, doesn't it? And, that, and, that's, and that's exactly the scenario you want to set up. So think about what's important to you in this deal, push it to the end of, of the negotiation, know what their deadline is, push right up against it if you can, and the deadline can be as simple as they have to pick their kids up at school, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be they're, they're leaving town. It can be something else that pushes them to make a decision. On page 20, we're talking about getting your agreement in writing. Now, we reuse written agreements in real estate for a number of reasons. If you ask a, a lawyer or a realtor why you use a written agreement, what will they say? <laughs> no, I'll say statute of frauds. The law requires you to have it in, in writing. Now, the, the part of that statement is true. The law really doesn't require you to have real estate contracts in writing. But what does it say? If they're in writing, what are they? You can enforce them in the court. Because, you know, if you think about how complicated real estate is, uh, they figured out a long time ago, you just can't shake hands, sell a piece of real estate. One guy's going to change his mind before it goes to closing. And you can't, can't go to court and litigate every one of those handshake deals. So, so you've got to write it down or you don't have any standing in court. But we write it down for a couple reasons. We write it down because if we wanted to enforce it in court, it'd be nice to have a written agreement. We write it down primarily so we know that both people understand the deal. Because if you don't write it down, it's real easy for one person to they hear something but not understand it. Uh, so and, and if you've made 20 deals and the person you're buying from has never made a deal before in their life, pretty likely they won't understand everything you say as, you, as you're negotiating this deal. So you want to write it down so they understand it. You also want to write it down because it gives you a way to uh, negotiate your deal. You know, when I, when I write it down, I generally write things down. One, I have a worksheet I use or I just use a yellow pad and I'll write down one thing at a time like we talked about right before the break. You know, we negotiate things one point at a time, and, and I test them by negotiating things which are not not as important to me to start with, just to see how they negotiate, how hard they'll fight. And then when we get down to things that are very important to me, I have some feel for how's it, how it's going, and, and I know how hard I can push to get, get what's important to me. So negotiate one point at a time, write them down. Uh, when we get a written offer, or we make an offer and get a written counteroffer, that does give us a chance to kind of reflect on that without responding real time, doesn't it? If you and I are negotiating face to face, that's going pretty fast. But if you write something down and give it to me, I might have a, a day to think about it, or at least a few hours to think about it before I respond. So having a written contract does give you that opportunity. And so when dealing through brokers, and I deal through brokers quite a bit, you, know, you, you get that, that written contract back and forth. It gives you a chance to reflect on it and figure out what your next counteroffer is going to be. There are no standard contracts. Uh, if it says standard on there, that's just a word they're using to impress you, to give it some authority. But a written contract does have some authority, doesn't it? People will see that written contract and they'll say, well, this is the way we're supposed to do things. Because here it is, it's all nice and typeset, great big letters, and, and people tend to pay attention to things that are typed up and written down. <clears throat> if a seller has a contract, I use it, but I read it very carefully. And if, if most sellers, if they have some contract, where would they get the contract? Well, it could be an agent, and it could be a copy of an agent's contract, but if you looked at the, the regular agent's contract, or is that a long contract or a short contract? It's pretty long, a lot of fine print. I think most sellers probably wouldn't understand that. They wouldn't understand everything in that contract. So really probably, almost, almost everyone. Uh, but they, they, so if they may have something they got out of a bookstore or online on some legal forms thing, but the chances are pretty good that they don't know what that contract says. So you want to make sure that you read that contract carefully. And uh, it's OK, and it really gives you kind of a strong position to use their contract, make them fill it out. Because now, if they try to make a claim that you took advantage of them, it was their contract, they filled it out, they're going to have a hard time making that claim stick. Don't get too excited about that point, because never in my career have I ever had somebody on the other side say, you took advantage of me. It just doesn't happen very often. Uh, you know, they, they might say they don't understand it, uh, but, but you want to, and that's why whenever I do something creative, uh, for example, get somebody to lend me money with no interest, I always get them to write that down. That is so unusual, 
and lawyers rarely see that, and closing companies rarely see that. You want to have them write that down if they're going to make you a loan with no interest. And I've bought an awful lot of houses where people would, would lend me part of the purchase price, part of the down payment, something at no interest. And it's an easy offer to make. You know, if, if somebody has some equity in the house and you offer them some cash and then you give them a $10,000 note with no interest and no payments due in 10 years, that's pretty easy to write down. I get them to write that down and that gets them up to their, their price maybe. But what is a $10,000 note with no interest and no payments for 10 years worth on a cash basis today? Not a much. Maybe 500 bucks. I mean, just a nominal amount. But as a way to get somebody their price, remember we talked about people's ego and how they get hung up on price sometimes. Sometimes it's a way to pay them their price, uh, you know, without writing a check today. And there's another opportunity because there's a good chance that after you do that, you might be able to pay that off at a discount down the road. My other rule in, in, in using contracts to buy houses, especially, is to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I think a major point of resistance to getting a contract signed is a contract that intimidates the sellers. They don't understand it. I mean, if you come out with a six-page contract that they've never seen before, they'll be scared, won't they? They'll, they'll be worried that there's something in that contract that's going to hurt them. I had a good friend who was a pretty sharp guy, and he owned a shopping center here in town. And uh, this guy wanted to buy his shopping center, and they agreed on the price. <coughs> So the buyer went down to his attorney and had the attorney draw up the purchase contract. Well, if you hire an attorney to draw up a purchase contract on a shopping center, take a guess how many pages were in that contract. It was in the 20s. You know, it was about that thick. Lots of big words. And the guy came to me and he showed me the contract. He said, I'm not going to sign this. And I said, do you like the price? He said, yeah, I like the price. He said, but I'm sure there's something in this contract that's going to get me. <laughs> and he was probably right, wasn't he? Yeah. So I said, well, I'm not going to read it then. <laughs> no, no, reason, no reason for me to read it if you're not going to sign it anyway. Uh, and that deal fell apart, not because of the price, not because of the terms. And these are pretty smart people on both sides, but because he was just confident that that, that contract was drawn and it was biased to the buyer and there was some gotcha in there someplace that he would miss and it would cost him some more money. And he was afraid of it. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, on, on a house basis, you're dealing with a different level of purchase and, and a different level of buyer and seller, but the seller typically is not going to be very sophisticated in the house, maybe the only house they've ever sold. So if you go to them with a long contract or a fancy contract or something in a lot of small print, you'll scare them many times. Now, the contract is enforceable in court. That's what we just said. That's one reason to have it written down because of the statute of frauds. It is enforceable in court, but it's a practical matter you're probably never going to go to court to enforce a contract when you're buying a house. And what's the reason for that? Because it's easier to go buy another house than it is to go to court and win that deal, right? Because you can't go by yourself. You've got to take somebody with you who's going to charge you, your favorite attorney. And uh, even if you did prevail, what do you get to do? You get to buy the house. Well, it's not like you get a check, right? I mean, you have, now you have to write a check, go to work, pay your attorney, may, maybe get some attorney's fees from the other people. But, you know, I, I figured out a long time ago, it doesn't make any sense for me to try to enforce a contract in court to buy a house. Now, if it's some different deal, maybe, but not to buy a house. Because it's so much easier to go out and buy another house and close on it than it is to go to court and try to close that first contract. As a practical matter, I know most of the judges in town, if I showed up in their courtroom and I said, I stole this house fair and square, they're going to throw me out. They're going to tell me not to pick on these people, go out and buy another house, you know, so it just wouldn't work. So even though a contract is enforceable, you probably are not going to enforce it. So here, here's the, the kind of the key. Because you're not going to enforce a contract in court, it doesn't have to be enforceable, does it? Which means it can be a very simple contract. I mean, I can agree to buy somebody's house and just write it down on a yellow pad and say, I'm buying Joe Smith's house, here's the address, here's the legal description, here's the price, I'll buy it as is, we both sign it. That may or may not be an enforceable contract, but if we close on it in a week, won't a week go by pretty fast? Okay? And if I'm taking it as is, and it's a simple deal, pay him some now, some later, the chances of that not closing are pretty remote. It'll probably close. 
So the form that I use to close it, the form I use for a contract, is not that important to me. I don't need a bulletproof contract. The people that need bulletproof contracts are worried about going to court or they go to court all the time. Okay? And I don't do either one of those things. I don't go to court at all. Uh, so, so the contract that I use to buy is a very simple one-page contract, probably not enforceable in court, and that doesn't break my heart because that means the other guy can't enforce it either. And it's going to be hard for them to come after me. Now, any contract you sign as a buyer should give you a way out, right? So if you're the buyer, you want a loophole, an inspection clause, something that allows you to back out of this deal if you don't want to close. On the same side, on the flip side, if you're a seller, what do you want in the contract? What happens if you sell a house to somebody and the next day somebody comes along with a better offer? You want money down. You want money down. It's good to have money down. But is there any language in that contract you could include that allows you to get out of the first deal? Yeah, you could write a contract that way. What I like to put in my contracts when I sell, and I rarely sell, is that if there is a contingency in the offer, and sometimes there is, isn't it? Sometimes it'll be subject to financing or subject to inspection. And most buyer's contracts are subject to something. If there's any kind of contingency in the offer when I'm selling, I put a paragraph in there, and it's in your book, that says that if I get another offer acceptable to me, I've got the right to call you up, and you can either waive your contingency and close within a certain period of time, or I'll give you your money back, and we'll go away friends. But it gives me the right to accept that other offer. Okay? So it's a backup offer, but I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to force your hand. You can either waive the contingency, so, so take it as is condition, have it inspected, do whatever you're going to do. Uh, if, you, if you have a loan contingency, you either have to waive it, which means you can lose your deposit if you don't close. Okay? So, so that protects you on a seller standpoint. Now, from a rental contract standpoint, why do we write down our rental agreements? Well, first of all, there's a lot of detail in there. I've got rules. My rental contract is really a rule sheet. It's six pages long. It's as long as somebody's purchase contracts. And every one of them, every paragraph in that agreement is a rule I want them to follow. So I do want to write it down because I want to read it to them. I want them to take it home and post it on a wall where they'll remember it. And I want to be able to enforce that. Okay? Now, I have gone to court to enforce rental contracts. When do you go to court to enforce a rental contract? When you evict somebody. When you evict somebody. So you need something in writing. Uh, you know, I guess you don't have to have it in writing to evict somebody, but it does make it easier. We are up to, I think, six evictions now uh, in 40-some years, so that's not many. But you still want to write it down. And, and, the, and the purpose of the rental contract is to give you a, a tool that you can use to, to screen people. So make sure they understand it, write it down. And because you have a typed up contract, and you know, they're not typeset, they're typed, because they're on my word processor, I change them occasionally. But because you have that written document, now you can say to people, I can't change anything in this agreement. Okay? And you can use the authority of this agreement, which puts you in a strong position. Right? Because you know, in a rental business, don't we have strong rules about discrimination? So I said, if I change any word in my rental contract, I'd be discriminating against somebody. Smoke and mirrors, but uh, sounds good, though, doesn't it? <laughs> but can't you change anything on any contract? Sure. Mutual agreement? Sure, you can change things on a contract. And I do change things on contracts, but I tell tenants that because I don't want tenants negotiating my contract. And if they try to negotiate my contract, what did I say before about tenants? Don't rent to them if they out negotiate you, right? So if, if the guy walks in and says, well, I won't do that. You know, I, won't, I don't want that $100 discount for paying on time. I want to pay late every month. Well, we're just not going to rent to you. We're not going to let you change that part. Down at the bottom, we gave you some, some uh, parts of a contract. Or I'm, I'm missing, a, missing a word here, but things that you need to include in a contract for it to be enforceable. And, and, uh, and you know, a regular contract will have a lot more detail, but... It has to be for a legal purpose, doesn't it? You can't have a contract to do something illegal. Uh, consideration, adequately describe the property, and I always put the address and a legal description. And you want the name of all the parties. So at the bare minimum, you want that information in your contract, whatever your contract you use. Uh, but it can be simple. So, so think simple. So important contract clauses for the buyer when inquiring a house on the next page. One good loophole is all you need. Don't, don't build in six loopholes that makes you look like a flake. You just have one. And my favorite is an inspection, an inspection loophole. The right to have the property inspected, the right to have the uh, condition of the title inspected. Okay? And if I don't like both of them, I don't have to close. And when do I want this, uh, this paragraph, this inspection period to end? The day of closing. 
day of closing. Well, that puts me in a very strong position. No uh, lawyer representing a seller would, would be happy with that. Because now, what, what does it allow the buyer to do? Walk away. Walk away up to the day of closing. You have to understand that coupled with that, my closing period is generally fairly short. Okay, this is not a, closing con a contract that's going to close in 90 days. This is a contract that's going to close in a week or so. So because it's a very short period of time to start with, that's a reasonable thing to ask for. If you had a contract that was going to close in three months, it would be unreasonable to say we're not going to give you, you know, we're not going to satisfy that contingency right up to the closing day because it just drives everybody crazy. But my deals typically do not involve new financing, so financing is not a contingency. So the inspection paragraph is my contingency, and you'll see that on that page. A couple other things. The deposit that you make is the money you have at risk, of course, when you're buying, so don't make one or make a very small one. Uh, I don't make a big deposit. I, I quite often don't make deposits at all, and, and we just we're going to settle up within a week. But if I make a deposit, it's $100, and I make it payable to the uh, title company that's going to close the deal. Know who that is up, up front. Uh, if, if we're going to take title subject to or assume a loan, you want to write a paragraph fairly carefully that deals with those two things. Taking subject to means you're going to acknowledge that there's a lien or a debt against the property, but you're not going to contact the bank. You're not going to assume the loan. You're not going to file any paperwork. And you will take the risk of that debt. So if for some reason that debt is foreclosed on, the risk is yours, what would you lose if there was a loan on there you took subject to and you didn't make the payments and the house was foreclosed on? You'd lose all the equity, wouldn't you? All your equity. So, that, and, and I've never done that. I've never had a foreclosure, never, never let anything go to foreclosure. I have taken subject to. You're taking some risk, of course, doing that, and you're putting the seller at some risk. Because until that loan is paid off that they signed when they borrowed the money to start with, that loan will always be a liability to them. So if you take subject to a loan and you don't make the payments and there's a foreclosure, the uh, seller who, who used to own that property, who signed that note, is still at risk. And in, in, in a state like Florida where the banks will come after you, the bank may come after them, try to get a judgment against them. So it, it puts them at risk. Assuming on terms acceptable to the buyer, you have to read that whole paragraph because terms acceptable to me may not be acceptable to the bank. So it allows me to try to negotiate with the lender to see if I can't get them to change some of the terms that are existing loan. We took title and assumed uh, four loans uh, locally, local bank, and we got them to take out the due on sale clause. Everybody know what a due on sale clause is? Due on sale clause says if the property is sold, the lender has a right to call the loan due. So we got them to strike through that. We got them to lower their interest rates. We got them to forgive the back payments. And this is a negotiation directly with the bank. And it was after we signed a purchase contract, subject to us being able to negotiate or assume the loans with the bank on terms agreeable to us. Okay? So you, can, you have, you have a two-step negotiation here if you have a, an institutional loan or even a private loan on a property that you need to renegotiate to make this deal work. Two-step process. You, need, you make your deal with a buyer, and then you make your deal with the lender. It's a lot like a short sale when you think about it, isn't it? Isn't that pretty much what a short sale is? The short sales are very common now. They have, they're not always common, but right now a short sale uh, lets you make a deal with a seller Subject to making a deal with the lender. Same thing. Michael. Do you have any uh, success with that with the big banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo? Chase, uh, City, not, not Bank of America or Wells yet. Well, they'll talk to you. They're still, well, occasionally, yeah. If you can get to the right person, they'll talk to you okay, but you, you need to make a, get, find a decision maker who can make a decision. And so it's not, it's not just talking about it. You've got to find somebody who can make a decision on that loan. But it may be in the loss mitigation department. If, if it is indeed a short sale, uh, then now at least there's somebody in charge of that loan and they're talking short sales. So uh, the loans that they want to get rid of or want to renegotiate uh, are, are more likely candidates. You've got to look at these short sales and loan renegotiations just like you do which property am I going to buy and make some kind of assessment fairly early on about your chances of making this deal work. Because if it's a long shot, you just don't want to spend months and months and time trying to, to close some of these short sales. Uh, it doesn't take, if you think about how much of, of your time it requires, 
as the buyer, it doesn't require a lot of time. Who invests a lot of time in these deals? <clears throat> the broker, you know, the agent. It takes a lot of their time. And sometimes and in this town, and probably your town too, they have uh, the title companies will actually negotiate or try to negotiate the short sale. They have somebody down there working to negotiate the short sale. So if you, I, I, I think the key is probably the person who's trying to negotiate the short sale, the contacts they have, how aggressive they are. Because some brokers just throw up their hands and they don't work very hard at it. And others seem to work very hard at it and be, they're able to get these deals done. Down at the bottom, we talk about what do you do when the other party wants their attorney to review the contract. I like to be clear with the seller, if that's who I'm dealing with, about the terms of the contract and about our agreement as to the price and terms. So if we've agreed on a price, we've agreed on a down payment, we've agreed on monthly payment, we've agreed on all that, let's set that part aside and say we've agreed on this. So we're not asking the attorney's opinion on this, we're asking the attorney's opinion on what? And if they have something particular they want to talk about, we'll write it down, but typically on, you know, on the enforceability of the contract or, you know, have we complied with all laws in the state of Florida and tax laws and all that? And, and if we haven't, you know, if we've, if we've accidentally violated some law, let the attorney advise us on which law we've violated and we'll try to fix that, okay? Now, we don't violate laws. What attorneys typically try to do is what? <coughs> Renegotiate the terms. Bigger down payment, more interest rate, something like that. And, and if we've already agreed on the terms, I don't want the attorney to renegotiate that. Donald Trump wrote a book called The Art of the Deal years ago. And I, I like the book because he negotiates the same way I do. He sits down before he brings the attorneys in, and he buys big stuff, of course, but he works out all the, all the terms of the purchase agreement, down payments, terms, all, all the ins and outs that would be involved in a big deal. And he writes that down, everybody signs it, and then he lets attorneys work on it. But he doesn't let the attorneys renegotiate this deal. And, and that's good technique. Don't let the attorneys get involved in renegotiating because now you have egos involved, don't you? If you get an attorney on both sides, you've got two egos involved. Most house sellers, most tenants, most people I deal with don't really have attorneys, do they? Yeah. I mean, they may know of an attorney, but they don't have somebody on staff, they don't have somebody on retainer, they don't have somebody to use all the time. So they don't have an attorney. And if they do know an attorney, it may be somebody who does other kind of work. Might do family law work or something, probably not a real estate attorney. So uh, what, what, what you uh, want to do is just have the conversation. And you can head it off in the past if you have the conversation. If somebody is saying to you, we want somebody else to look at this deal, what are they really saying? We don't trust you. We don't like it. We don't trust you. We don't like it. We're not going to do it. That, that's the sign I'm getting. And we're not, this, this deal is not going the right direction. If they want somebody else to look at it and we'll get back to you, I'd say that deal is not going to work. So at that point, you need to make a decision. We want to work harder on this. Okay? And, and what I've learned to do is say, okay, there must be something else that, you know, that we haven't talked about that's holding you back here. Because uh, you know, I, I think we can show it to the attorney and they'll be happy with it, but what else? What, what have we missed here? What, 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 you know, what, and see if I can't reopen the negotiation. Because if they really need to sell this house and I'm happy to buy the house, I want to try to put the deal together. But I've never, ever once had them go to a second party, be it their spouse, be it the attorney, be it anybody, and come back and say, oh, sure, we'll do it now. It just doesn't happen. And once they take it off the table, that's really a no. So, so recognize that sign and uh, either agree to renegotiate or, or walk away. Negotiating owner financing on page 22. When I negotiate the terms of owner financing, I do the same thing I do when I, when I negotiate a contract. I, I think about what's important to me. I make a list, and then I negotiate things in a, in a particular order, leaving things that are most important to me to the end of that list. So when I negotiate, if the payments are the most important, I leave that to the end. If it's a down payment, I'll leave that to the end. But I write down here before I start, because it's, it's, it's a movable feast. It's not exactly the same negotiation every time. Uh, I write down the largest down payment I'm going to make, and I'll write that number down. And, you know, I'll take this list and I'll put a number next to that, because I know how much cash I have in the bank. I know what the market is. I know what this house is. I know what, a, what kind of cash I want to risk on this particular house. And, and uh, if I get caught up in the heat of negotiation, I might take my 10000 and double it to 20000 which would be a mistake. So I write it down and so I can stick with it, so I have benchmarks. And the shortest term I would accept, 
Larry asked me what the shortest lease option deal I would do, and I said five years. Owner financing is different than a lease option. With a lease option, five years goes by, and I decide I'm not going to close in this house, what happens? Nothing. I walk away. I have an option to buy it. There's absolutely no negative consequences to that. If I purchase the house with owner financing and five years goes by and, and I can't refinance, I can't sell, I'm stuck with a house, now what happens? Well, it's a little stickier, isn't it? Because if I offer to deed it back to them and they won't take it and they foreclose, we could, we could have a problem. Uh, and again, I haven't had that happen, but it could happen. So with owner financing, I'm looking for a longer term or ideally, I'd like to build in some kind of extension. So I say to you, you know, if five years goes by and I can't get a loan and I can't sell it to somebody because the market is still bad, what I'd like to do is be able to buy an extension from you. What if I paid down 10% of the remaining outstanding principal balance and we go another five years? Okay? And that's pretty easy to sell because it makes sense to both sides and, and it's a lot cheaper. Let's say you've negotiated a 4% interest rate. Five years goes by, rates are higher, you don't want to get a new loan, and you have the right to pay down 10% of your principal balance, and let's say you owe them $150,000. So you have to pay down $15,000, but you get five more years on this loan at 4%. Well, that's a great deal, isn't it? That's a great deal. Now, you have to budget for that 15, but, but that's, that's a lot smarter than going out and getting a new loan at 6% or something else. So, so negotiate that type of extension into your contracts. Your first offer should be better than your outside limits, of course, because that's, that's the, 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 the lowest you'll go. Show the seller how you arrived at your offer. Give them a reason for numbers. If you give people a reason, some logic about how you came up with the down payment, how you came up with the monthly payment, how you came up with the interest rate, and if it makes sense to them, then you're giving them a, a way, a tool, to justify it to themselves or maybe to their spouse. I mean, it's got to be logical, though. Now, logically, you only have so much to put down. I mean, you don't have unlimited funds. But the monthly payment, it's very easy to come up with some logic behind how much you can afford to pay a month. And you would do that by looking at the income it produces, right? And subtract it from the income it produces, your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your vacancy, maintenance costs if you have any. Uh, you know, management costs if you have any. Larry's got a great sheet on this that he uses. Uh, but it, it just makes sense to use this logic and then you come up with this number which make, you know, has some, some validity. And you can, so you might start off with $1,000 a month rent and come down to about a $600 a month uh, net figure that you can use to make monthly payments. Now if they have to have $700 a month and you only have $600 a month income to pay them with, something else has to give, doesn't it? Something else has to give. Well, we have a lot of things we can negotiate. Price would be one thing. What else could we negotiate, though? Length. The length. So if we have, we have different parts of, a, of a, a loan, right? We've got the, the payment, the interest rate, the uh, principal balance, which would be the price, and then we've got uh, the, 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 what did I miss, the payment? payment? Payment, yeah. So they're all tied together. So if the payment's got to be $100 a month high, how can we make that good for us? Well, we could reduce the price, but what else could we reduce? The interest rate. We could reduce the interest rate. If somebody would give me a 3% interest rate instead of a 4% interest rate, you think I'd agree to pay them $600 a month instead of $500 a month? Yeah. Got to do the math, but off the top of my head, it sounds like I probably would, right? Because what's going to happen to the term of the loan now? It's going to go down. It's going to go down. One of the first classes I ever took was taught by a couple guys from out west, and they said you should negotiate hard over every eighth of a point in interest, which I thought was kind of an exaggeration. But the longer I've been around, and the more interest I've paid, because if you owe a lot of money, you pay a lot of interest, I've really noticed the effect interest rates have on your cash flow. You know, and when people come to me and say, we've got a cash flow problem, I make them list all their loans and the interest rates, and the average interest rate's generally eight or nine percent. Well, if you're paying an average of 4 or 5% instead of 8 or 9%, and you owe a million dollars, how much more interest do you pay at 9 than you do at 6? $30,000. $30,000. $30,000 divided by 12 is 2,500 a month. Thanks, I appreciate the help. 2,500 a month. And how many houses would a million be? Would that be 10? 
we call it 10. So if it's $2,500 a month and there's 10 houses, how much is that per house per month? This is a hard one, 25 divided by 10. $250 a month. $250 a month per house, cash flow. That's a lot of cash flow, isn't it? And that's the difference in my mind between positive and negative cash flow is the interest rate those people are paying. Okay? So take that advice that I got years ago to heart and negotiate hard over interest rates. People are funny. They'll fight much more over a price or, or a payment today than they will over the interest rate because they don't understand the long-term effect of that, the, the difference in rate. So, so try to negotiate some really cheap interest this year. You'll be happier. Now, at the bottom, Warren Harding taught us this, this question years ago, but you, you can ask, ask people if it's fair for you to be paid for your work. If you'll maintain a house, manage a house, take all the tenants' calls, you know, is it fair? Yes. You do all that work, is it fair you get some compensation? Well, when you're drawing up your list of things, taxes, insurance, maintenance, plug in something for the fair pay. What is it, 100 bucks a month? What's, what's fair pay for me to take care of a house? Whatever it is, write it down. But that's just one more number you can deduct from the gross income to get down to what income you have left to make payments with. Points to negotiate with owner financing on the next page. A couple things you, 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 that don't pop up too much, but insurance is a big issue, isn't it? With owner financing, you can negotiate the requirement for insurance, and it can be a lot less than what the banks require. You go buy insurance for, a, for if the bank places insurance for you, what kind of insurance are you going to have? How much will they sell you? A lot. A lot more than a house is worth. I mean, I've got houses insured for $200,000. If they burn down, it would cost one hundred twenty-five dollars to rebuild them. You know, they're guessing way high on this insurance. So we can state how much insurance we need to carry. We can state a larger deductible. We can do things that will save us insurance costs with an owner financing deal. When the interest starts to accrue, it doesn't have to start to accrue the first day. Now, with a bank, it starts to accrue the first day, doesn't it? With a bank, the payments start the next month. You know, the bank is very rigid on their terms. But uh, when you're dealing with an owner, they can be much more negotiable. I mean, if you say to them, look, I've got to remodel this house the first year, so how about we make the first payment due January 1 next year? That'll give me the rest of this year to get the house totally remodeled, get it in good shape, find a tenant, and I'll start making you payments next January. A lot of people say, sure. Well, a bank won't say sure, will they? I mean, they're not going to give you four or five months without payments, but a lent, an owner will say sure many times, and that saves you a lot of money and also gives you the ability to, to do what you need to do to make this thing work. Uh, security for the loan, you can use other property than the property you're borrowing against as collateral. If you have something that's hard to finance, does anybody here have something that's hard to finance? You own something that the banks won't lend against right now? What kind of property won't the banks lend against? Land is probably pretty tough to get a land loan right now. What about an empty office building? Would that be hard to finance? Empty commercial building? Maybe even a duplex? I mean, the banks are really picky about what to lend on right now. And, and this goes through phases, doesn't it? I mean, there's some times where they're easier to lend. But if you have somebody who, let's say you're buying a house from an investor, and they've agreed to carry back owner financing, <coughs> and you had something else that you own that was difficult to finance, well, a house is pretty easy to finance, isn't it? Banks will take houses as collateral, but if you had a duplex or you had a piece of land or you had an office building or something, a good offer might be, and we will secure the note that we're going to pay you by whatever else you have that you can't finance someplace else. Okay? And by doing that, you put a loan on a property which is very hard to finance, and when you do that, what happens to the value of that property? It goes up. It becomes more valuable, and what you end up with is a free and clear house over here, which is fairly easy to finance. If you needed to borrow money, it's going to be easier to borrow money against your free and clear house than it would be against all the rest of those properties we talked about. So you don't have that flexibility with a lender, with a bank, but you do with an owner. A lot of this stuff is uh, pretty self-explanatory. Early payment discount, if you, if you are borrowing from a private uh, not, not an investor now, not a hard money lender, but a private seller, and you agree to make them payments of a thousand bucks a month for the next 12 months, and you go to them at closing and say, if I paid a year in advance, would that be helpful to you? No, would that be helpful to some people? 
Now, you don't want to do this if they owe a bunch of money to somebody else they've got to pay, but if they own a house free and clear, where you pay them a year in advance and they don't ever have any other payments to make, so they can't lose the house in foreclosure. Everybody clear about what I'm talking about here? You know, if they had a big loan on it and they're going to use your payment each month to make a bank payment, you wouldn't want to do this because they may just take your money and run. But if they own the house free and clear and you gave them an advance, if they gave you a 10% discount, they knocked 10% off of what you owe them. So instead of paying them 12000 you paid them $10,800. Would that be a good deal for you? It would be. Most of the time, they'll knock more than that off. Most of the time, you can give them $10,000 for $12,000. Okay. Giving them $10,000 for $12,000, I mean, you've got to write a big check to write that $12,000. You have to have some money in the bank to do that. But if you'll sit down and get a financial calculator and ask it the question, what kind of return am I making on my money if I invest $10,000 a day and I don't have to make a $1,000 a month payment for the next 12 months, the answer is going to be really good. It says write that on the screen. It'll say really good on there. Good, good, <laughs> good job. Good job because the number is close to 40%. It's close to 40%. And everybody says, wow. Now, why is it? But if you get a 20% discount for paying something early, and you're going to pay some of it next month anyway, weren't you? Think about that. You're going to pay $1,000 next month anyway. So you got a $200 discount on next month, in, in effect. If you do all the math, it really comes out to about 40% about of your money. And that's what, what makes it so spectacular is it safe? Because you were going to pay it anyway. If somebody came to you and said, we'll pay you 20% for your money if you'll lend it to us for six months, would you do it? I got one nod yes in the whole class. So we got one gambler out there. Yeah. But if somebody pays you 20% for six months, that'd be 40% for a year. Doesn't that sound like it could be a little risky? Real risky. But if you're paying stuff that you owe already and you're going to pay it already, there's no risk to it, is it? That was your money. So it's 100% safe. So any discount you can get, really, above a nominal amount, any discount you can get for doing it, if you can afford to do that, increases your profits. Other things you can negotiate, frequency of payments. You know, you're going to make them monthly, quarterly, annually. How often are you going to make them? Uh, the amount of the payment, date the first payments due, and the down payment. Again, again, make that list when you go to negotiate with somebody and you're getting owner financing, and write down the, that list in order that's important to you. You know, don't use my list. Reorganize that list and write down what's important to you that day. Because that day, you may have some cash in the bank. You may be willing to make a bigger down payment if you can get a better price. Or you may be better, willing to make a bigger down payment if you can get more cash flow. Yeah. How do you pitch the securitization? You're going to secure the loan with a different property. How do you tell it to the seller? So you already have a first, and this is going to be a second on another property? You said you have a nice and free and clear house, and you let your third duplex going to be the securitization. The security, yes, yes. How do I tell them? I show it to them. Oh. I, I say, here's, here's, here's the deal I'd like to make you. I own this duplex. I've got rents from both sides. Here's how much rent I collect. I'd like to give you a first, first mortgage on that duplex, and I'll have plenty of income on that duplex to make your payment each month so it's safer for you. Okay? On your house, it's going to be empty until I fix it up. And so you know, I mean, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Now, it's got to make some kind of sense, but it does make, if it does make sense, you, know, you can sell it pretty easily. It, it works. And remember, I started off by saying if I'm buying a house from an investor, this works really well because they understand different kinds of property. And somebody who's an investor may prefer something with more income, like a duplex. If they had to foreclose. They may prefer to have the duplex back, not their house. The close. When to stop negotiating on the next page. Have in your mind, before you start negotiating, what your goals are. You know, what, what the good deal for you looks like, what the down payment looks like, what the monthly payments look like, what the interest rate looks like, knowing there's some trade-off in there. So if you get a, have to make bigger payments, maybe you get a lower interest rate. But have a ballpark idea of where you're going with this. And when you get there, quit pushing. You know, if you get to a deal where a deal is a good deal, stop asking for more. Now, I'll talk to you later about offers and counteroffers. If the other person keeps asking for more, one way to slow them down is every time they ask for something, you ask for something back. Okay? And if you do that, after a while, they catch on that every time they ask for something, you ask for something back, and they'll quit asking for something. And so that's, that's really just good negotiating technique. But once you get to a point where you know the deal is close enough for you, you know, and real estate's a close enough game. 
Uh, this, this is not a, a game of decimal points. Uh, you know, I'm not worried about making 12.6% of my money. I'm worried about buying things below the market that have cash flow. And, and the important things to me are, will it rent to a good tenant? Is it in a good neighborhood where I don't have to worry about the neighbors? Is it well built where my maintenance costs will be reasonable? And all these are soft factors, aren't they? These are, these are not number factors. These are more kind of judgment calls. But if all those things are lined up and I can make a good deal based on what I wrote down, then when I get to the, to the close, close enough, I'm going to try to close this thing. I'm going to get the people to, I'm, we're going to be writing things down. Remember my technique here. I'm taking a piece of paper and I'm writing down point by point things that we need to talk about, and when we agree on them, we write them down. So now I've, I've got this list in front of me of things we've agreed on, and, and if I don't want to go to a formal contract, I can just turn that list around and say, look, here are the things we agreed on. You sign it, I'll sign it, we'll take it to a title company, we'll get them to do the paperwork, and we'll close next Tuesday. Okay? That, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Because there's not any fine print. There's nothing to worry about. Now, the best offer for you to make a seller who doesn't have a lot of sophistication is an offer where they get a net amount. So where you agree to pay the closing costs, where you agree to take the property as is, subject to an inspection, you want to make sure you're getting what you're paying for. But if you'll do that, then you can give them a net amount. And by net amount, I mean you can say, and at closing, you'll get a check for $10,000. There'll be no deductions. I'll pay all the costs. You don't have to worry about what the stamps are going to cost or title fees or all that stuff. I'll pay all that. You get a check for $10,000. And starting next January, I'll start writing you a check each month for $600 a month. We'll do that for however many months it is. You're making it easy for them to make a decision, aren't you? A nice, clean deal. It's easy for them to explain to somebody else if they need to explain it to somebody else. So keep the deals as clean and simple as possible is easier to get agreement. So we talk about that on page 24, about writing down the points as you agree to them. If you can't agree on a particular point, write the point down, okay, and agree to come back to it. So if you can't agree for some reason on the date the first payment's going to be made, skip over that, come back to it. Now if that's important to you, when do you want to negotiate it? Yeah. At the end at the end, after you've agreed on everything else. Because what have we done? We've got to invest this time, right? They've invested emotionally in us. They've got, we've got a lot of things going our way. And if there's only one thing that's hanging us up, maybe there's room for us to compromise a little bit. And then we can say, look, instead of having the first payment due in January, if we made the first payment due in December, do we have a deal? And you ask a question like that. And if they say, yeah, that sounds good. Well, you got a deal, don't you? Turn it around, get them to sign it, take it to the title company, get it closed. You can use a contract if you want to. And I, again, I have a simple contract that I use, and, and, and you know, nothing special about my contract except it's one page. But if, if you want to reduce this to a contract, what does a contract say that will protect you as the buyer, typically? It has specific language that, does with, that deals with the title. Okay, so, so if, you're, if you're new at this uh, and, and you haven't had the courses, you don't, you know, I happen to be married to a wife who's a uh, real estate attorney, so I've got a little inside track here. But if you don't have, and I used to teach the course, so uh, if you don't have that kind of knowledge, it probably using the standard form contract will give you some protection because you want to make sure that you have a paragraph that says, if they don't have good title, I don't have to pay them, I get my money back. So, so get that part written down. And at the bottom, we'll give you a little example. Next page, home, in, home inspection reports. Making an offer subject to home inspection report allows you to take a little bit of a chance, doesn't it? Uh, I, I have bought a number of houses sight unseen. Now, that may sound crazy, but when I go see a house, a strange thing happens to me. I generally like it. <laughs> and, and if I like the house, see, that's a bad emotion, right? When I like the house, I'm likely to pay a little bit more for it because I, I start visualizing how nice this house will look and how good the neighborhood is and what a great tenant I'll get. 
So buying a house before you see it gives you some advantage. That may sound crazy, but it gives you some advantage. Now, that doesn't mean you should never see the house, but it does mean that, that, that you shouldn't get emotionally involved with a house until you've made your deal. And that's one reason not to negotiate the deal in the house. If the house is in nice shape, people are still living there, that, 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 that pulls you in the wrong direction. So having a, a, a subject to inspection clause gives you that advantage. You can actually make an offer on properties you haven't seen, subject to inspection, and people that buy large volumes of property do this all the time, right? Uh, I'm sure Blackstone's not going out and looking at every house they buy. Somebody just does an inspection report and they just look at the numbers. So that, that's the way they work on it. Get a price reduction for real defects. It, it's not there for you to increase your profit, but we've had a couple instances recently. I told you about the one that we had an inspection on it and got done an illegal addition, had termites in the house. We had another house we bought over here on the creek. And uh, the grass was so tall in the backyard of this house that we couldn't see the seawall. So by, we bought it and subject to inspection, and we mowed the grass, which is a good idea, by the way. And then we went down to look at the seawall and seawall issues. So we went back and renegotiated. Got about $18,000 more out of the seller on that deal. So having an inspection paragraph is very important in it especially if you're buying older houses because there are sometimes some major issues with them. So, so make sure you, you use it well, but it's not there to increase your profit. It's there to keep you from getting hurt. So, so don't get this wrong. Now, if I had to put $18,000 into a seawall, whose pocket does that come out of? Mine. So what, am I want, what do I want to negotiate? Both price and what? Down payment. Down payment, because that's kind of a cash down payment I have to make right after I buy the house. Now, you don't have to fix every defect, do you? Okay. Here's where you might have some advantage. I probably didn't have to fix that seawall, although the seawall needed to be fixed, but could I have sold that house to somebody else or rented it with a bad seawall? Yeah. You know, now, seawall is kind of a technical issue because at some point the government will actually make you fix it or anything, but there, there may be a better example than that. But if it, had a, uh, you know, if it had some other defect which you didn't have to fix to rent it, well, that would work to your advantage, wouldn't you? You'd be, you'd be ahead, dollars ahead, and maybe you'd have to fix it before you sold it. But for example, if it had a, a, an addition put on without a permit, okay, that's, that's going to be an issue maybe when you sell the house, but can you rent a house to somebody that has an addition put on without a permit, and will they care? No, they'll, they'll be happy, won't they? They'll like that addition. So, I mean, there's some things you don't have to fix, but you can get compensated for going in. And the last point says, some states by statute give a seller the right to back out. And that, that's a trend. So watch your state law to see how that was going to affect you. Negotiations at the closing on page 26. Not every state has face-to-face -face closings. There's different traditions in different states. Quite often uh, in, in, a, in the state of Florida, the buyers and the sellers will show up at the closing table at the same time. Who's that better for, the buyer or the seller? Buyer. Better for the buyer. Better for the buyer. Because what can happen? There can be other things that pop up about the property. That are, you know, maybe the property has some other defects that get found out at the last minute. Uh, you know what a walkthrough is? Walkthrough inspection? Walk-through inspection is something you do typically right before the closing, and the buyer does it. Now, sometimes an agent will be there too, but you, as a buyer, you want to do a walk-through inspection to make sure the house is cleaned out, make sure there's nothing left behind that'll cost you any money, uh, to make sure nothing's broken. You know, go go through and make sure that, that windows and plumbing and all that stuff does work. Because if you don't do that, and you, you come up with windows you have to replace, or doors you have to replace, or termites or whatever. Uh, it can cost you a lot of money. So you, you want to do that. Uh, and if, if the seller's there, you get the chance to talk to them about maybe giving you some more money. Well, as a seller, I never go to closings. Because if I don't show up at a closing as a seller, the buyer has two choices. Close, not close. They can't talk me out of any more money, right? Because if I'm not there, there's nobody to talk to. So I'm not there, nor am I available by phone. I just call the next day and go down and pick up my check if it's there. And that works pretty well because, because we have uh, all this uh, authority at the closing table, right? Ever, you've been to closings, right? Most of you have been to closings. What do you do at a closing? Do you sign anything? Yeah. Sign lots of stuff? Do you read it all before you sign it? Huh? How many people have read it all before you signed it? Well, here's a little rule for you. Never sign something that you haven't read at least a day ahead of time. 
when I have closings where I have to sign things, I make the title company, and this is no big deal, they can email it to you, right? I mean, it's not like they have to waste a tree, send you the documents so you can read them carefully. I've only had one closing statement in my life, and I've been to several hundred closings, that was right. Yeah. One out of probably 500 closings that was right. Okay? There's a mistake on almost every one of them. And you won't find that mistake if you're reading it real fast and signing hard here. And some of them are $1,000 bills. So read that thing carefully. You want to read uh, 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 any documents, especially notes and mortgages. If you're the buyer and there's a purchase money note and mortgage, you want to read that pretty carefully, don't you, to make sure it says what you agreed on because it's real easy for them to make a mistake on that. And if you're buying and you're their purchaser and there's a note and mortgage, you can give them the forms that you want to use, and they'll use your forms. Well, that's kind of convenient because you've already read those, right? And if you have good forms that have language in there that's favorable to you, now who else gets to approve those? Yeah, the sellers get to approve them, so they'll send them to the sellers. Will they read them? No, so that'll work out pretty well. Uh, and, and I'm not saying you take unfair advantage of anybody, but I'm just saying if you've got a personal a note that you like, use your note. You know, use paperwork that you like because you understand it. You've got it. Okay? Uh, but there's a lot of authority at closing because people say, sign right here. And what do people tend to do? Sign, sign right there. The third from the bottom talks about getting a security deposit from the seller if they're going to stay in the property. This is real important. Uh, you know, because as, as the point was made early, Larry made a point once, that if, if you let a seller stay in a house and they've made you a really good deal, they may have second thoughts. So you have to make sure that you have enough money left in the deal to give them a chunk of money when they move out. And I would say a minimum of $5,000 and more is better because for a certain amount of money, they will move out because they want that cash. But if you only give them a couple hundred dollars or, or I've seen people allow sellers to stay in the house without a rental contract, without paying rent, and they get nothing when they move out. Well, what if they don't move? What are you going to do? It can cost you a lot of money. So be very careful about that. When you're buying on a lease option or with owner financing, it's good at the closing to plant the seed that if I pay early or if I pay payments in advance, well, you give me a discount. You know, if you owe somebody $10,000, you're going to pay them in five years. In three or four years down the road, somebody comes along and makes you an offer on that house that you want to take, so you're going to get your money early. It's smart to call the people up you owe the money to and say, if I pay you off early, would that help you? And most of the time, it does. You know, getting paid early helps almost everybody. So even if it only helps them a little bit, and they take $1,000 off what you owe them or $2,000 off what you owe them, that's still pretty serious money, isn't it, on a $10,000 deal? On a bigger deal, it can be an awful lot more money than that. But set that seed. Uh, you can even write it down. For example, on my lease options, I will write down, because I'll have this conversation at the closing table. I'll say, you know, if we exercise this option early for some reason, instead of waiting the whole 10 years, if I was able to buy it in the first five years, would that be better for you? And I'll wait till somebody says yes. I said, well, if we could buy it in the first five years instead of waiting a full 10 years, could we get a little discount on the price and see what they say? And they'll, they'll say yes. And I'll ask how much. Now, whatever they say, I don't care if they say $1,000. We're going to write it down because we have, we're not going to do that now, are we? What we're doing is we're kind of setting, planting the seed that maybe someday I'll call them up. And here's how the conversation goes when I call them up. Say, look, you remember, I'm buying this house from you on a lease option. The people in there want to buy it from me. They don't have much money. They can afford to pay $120,000. I don't think we should take it. Because if I take the $120,000, no, I'm supposed to pay you $115,000. That's not enough in there for me. So here's the only thing I can think of. I'm willing to take $10,000 if you're willing to take a $5,000 discount. Okay? And let them, let them know that we're in this together. So if they decide to take a discount, they see that I'm taking the discount too. And what am I, what's my advice to them? I don't think we should do this. I don't think we should do this. Now, that's a whole lot different than hard selling them, isn't it? If you call them up and say, I think we should do this, now they're going to resist. But if you're saying, I don't think we should do this, if they resist, what's going on? They want to do this. 
They want to do this. So by putting yourself on the same side of the equation with them, saying, I don't think we should do this, and here's why, because I'm going to lose some money, you're going to lose some money, it's not good for either one of us, but I wanted to call you because it's an opportunity. You know, and if somebody makes me an offer, I just don't want to just say no. So, so let me know what you think. And I put absolutely no pressure on them. But if they do decide to take a discount, now we can both make some money, can't we? We've already talked about making payments ahead, so that's the next line. The next couple pages, you'll see the timeline of a negotiation we are involved in. And this total timeline is three days long. And then three days on this one house, we made one, two, three, four, five. There were six offers. There were five offers, and it was accepted. Five offers in three days. The numbers aren't, aren't very impressive, and I didn't put it in there because of the numbers. I put it in there so you could see the frequency, see how often we made offers. We made two and three offers sometimes in a day. We gave people very short times to respond. This was through an agent. It was an out-of-town owner. It was an empty house. House had been for sale for a year. So all those things made sense to me, right? Out-of-town owner, empty house, house had been listed for a year. I knew this guy wanted to sell this house. I was pretty sure they did. And uh, so you can, you can read about the whole thing. But the, the reason I put it in the book is to show you that when you're in an actual negotiation, it goes back and forth pretty fast, doesn't it? You think the broker's taking my phone calls? Sure, they're looking for my phone call because we're going back and forth with these offers two or three times a day. And, and that, that's how it works in the real world. It, it happens, you know, you, you, you're fairly aggressive when you're pursuing something and, uh, because you want to deal up, it close pretty fast. You will notice a couple times that the couple things I look for in a negotiation like this is how much the seller drops their price in reaction to my counter offers. And if you look at the first couple ones, the first one they dropped at five thousand, and the second one they dropped at five thousand, the second time, third time they only dropped at four hundred dollars. When they only dropped at four hundred dollars, I switch gears, and rather than making them another price offer, I changed the whole idea, and I said, well, I can pay you your price if we use a lease option and let me pay you so much down now and so much per month, okay? Which, you know, that was a total change of tactics and, and the broker was tracking this way, of course, thinking we were going the right direction. Now I took this corner and now the broker throws up his hands and the seller is confused and everybody said, well, let, let's go back and revisit some of those lower offers he made and that's what happened. And we ended up buying it without a lease option on cash purchase at a lower price. But it, my point is, when, when you reach an impasse, when, when, the, uh, when you're making offers and, and the seller is making very minor reductions, you know, they chunk, chunk, and then a very small drop, change your offer. Make a different kind of offer. Kind of gets their attention, and then you can get them back on track. Negotiating with buyers on the next page, page 29. When you have somebody buying a house from you, okay, you want to listen very carefully to what they say. Sometimes they say, this is our first offer. Well, what does that mean? It means they're, going to make, they, they're just testing the water, making more offers. You know, buyers are pretty funny. They're pretty timid, typically. Uh, they don't want to insult you. You know, when somebody likes your house, you know, buying a house is a big decision, isn't it? Buying a house to live in is a big decision. And, and if, you'll, if you can somehow eavesdrop on them and listen to people talk, and, and that's what they used to do. I don't know if anybody's ever been involved in land sales operations, but in the old days in land sales operation, they would actually have a microphone in the room, and they'd let the couple be by themselves and discuss it, and they'd be listening in the next room, of course, and then they'd come back in and overcome all the objections. Well, that, that was interesting. Oh, yeah, really. Absolutely really. Uh, so that's how they sold all that land in Florida. How else would you sell all that land? But, but you know, we never used a microphone, but cell phones work pretty well. Uh, <laughs> I had a guy call me about, it's been a while, a year ago now, and he was looking at a house. You know, we don't show houses. We figured out a long time ago, we, I don't need a better suntan. I'm plenty brown. Uh, but so we have somebody who wants to buy a house we have for sale, we send them out there with the keys. To take your time, look at a house, spend as much time as you want. Call me if you have any questions. Well, when they call you, you can hear the conversation on the other end, right? So the guy called me, and he had a question about the house. And I hear his wife say, I love this house. <laughs> Perfect day. Perfect day. Because once I know the wife loves the house, what can I stop doing? <laughs> Making concessions, right? Because who makes the decisions in that family? Got it. I got to figure it out. 
So, but you know, if you if you get some inside information like that, you listen to people talk, you watch them talk, you get signs, you can figure out if they really like your house, and if they really like your house, you don't have to give much away, do you? Uh, so that's kind of the short, the short course in negotiating with sellers. Uh, never respond to a verbal offer because people will do that to you. You know, would you take uh, 160 for the house? Don't respond. Make, make them put it in writing. If they won't go to the trouble of putting it in writing, because that is trouble, right? It takes a little effort to put it in writing. If they won't invest that time, they're not invested in the deal at all, are they? So you want them to invest themselves in the deal. Right? We've talked about that several times today. Ask them if they're ready to sign a contract today. Beware of offers that take your property off the market without compensation. So don't let somebody take your property off the market with, a, with an option deposit or a deposit with a contingency unless you protect yourself with that paragraph we talked about, which you'll find right below us here. Uh, number five talks about that. It says, uh, if, if we receive another offer that's acceptable to us, we can give them 48 hours to remove all contingencies or the contract will become null and void and deposits will be returned to the purchaser. So if I have a contract with you and I've sold you the house, somebody else comes along and offers me more or to maybe the same price but no contingencies and I want to take that offer, I want to be able to get out of the deal with you. So you get to either eliminate the contingencies or, or uh, go ahead and close or, or get your deposit back. When you get a low offer, get to know them a little bit before making a counter offer. Okay? I like to be face to face with people buying houses from me. I, I sell most of my houses on lease options and I did a whole course on selling houses on lease options. And The reason I do that is, first of all, I give a lot of families a chance to buy a house who can't really buy a house yet because they can't qualify with a bank loan. You know, to qualify for a bank loan, especially in a tight market, is hard. But I can sell a house on a lease option to somebody who has five or $10,000 cash to put down down payment money is not a big issue. They can afford to make monthly payments, so 1000 or 1200 bucks a month. But what they can't do is qualify for a bank loan. So the thing I guard against in a market where I think we're at the bottom and it might be going up is price increases. And can I build a price increase into my lease option? I can. So I, I could say if you don't buy it the first year, the second year, the price is going to go up so much and the rent's going to go up so much. So I can give them incentives to go ahead and close sooner. But by doing that, I eliminate a lot of my cost because when I sell a house on a lease option, I always put in there a paragraph that says they are responsible for all the closing costs. So if they need an appraisal, they need title insurance, uh, credit reports, whatever they need, they're responsible for all of them. Well, that's a pretty big number, isn't it? Okay, I always put in there that there's no commissions to be paid. Well, that, that's a number. And the other thing I put in there is they're buying a house in as-is condition. So if it needs any work, they have to do the work before they close on it. Well, those three things combined make a big difference between my gross sales price and my net sales price. If you take an average sale, and if something is listed at $175,000, the offer typically will be less than $175,000. There'll be a commission paid. There'll be a gap here between the time you sign a contract and close. There'll be, of course, a waiting period between now and when you sign the contract. So those two gaps together might be three, four, five months that you're not getting any income. Okay? And you're probably responsible for some of the closing costs. Well, I've compared my nets with these two deals, and my net income on a lease option is significantly higher. I mean, like 15% higher. So I sell on a lease option. And the other thing with a lease option is I don't have to negotiate the sales price. I can use a top dollar sales price. Now, you can't sell something for more than what it's worth. Because eventually, somebody buying on a lease option is going to go down to the bank and get a loan. And when they do that, the house is going to be appraised. So the appraisal has to somehow get pretty darn close to the purchase price, right? So you can't take a $175,000 house and sell it for two fifty. dollars That ain't going to work. It'll only sell for what it's worth. But if people stay there for a year or two, they make some improvements to it. Market gets a little bit better. Their credit gets a little bit better. A lot of times, the house will go right up and meet that appraisal, and the deal works out. Uh, people always ask me what percentages of your lease options actually close, and if historically, go back over the long time, it's about half, about half of them close. Now, not all of them close the first year. Sometimes we give them another year or a third year in order to get them closed, but if, if the people are good people and they're working on their credit and you know, they stay married, they keep their jobs, so they're going the right direction, then, then they'll get it closed. Yeah, Dan? What, what kind of uh, credit do you give them of their lease payments? 
Good question. The question is, what kind of credit do I give them each month on a lease option? And I type right in my document, so it's, we know it's right, $100 a month. And that's all I give them. Now, when I'm buying, I try to get a lot more than that. But when I'm selling $100 a month, it's not exactly equal to a principal payment, but it's ballpark. If you had a 30-year loan and a moderately priced house, it's not far off what the principal payment would be you know, on a $125,000, $150,000 house. And I do that, and it says right on my contract, so I can only do it for so long. It says in there I can just do that for one year. So after the second year, if you extend, you're not getting $100 a month credit anymore. Okay. And I, I wish I could change that, but I'd be discriminating. <laughs> now, one reason to use $100 a month credit is if you give them a whole bunch of credit, $500 a month, $1,000 a month, the banks won't count it. The banks will only count credit for rent paid in excess of fair market rent. Okay, so in theory, you're supposed to be charging $1,200 bucks for a $1,100 a month house to give them a $100 credit. But I can tell you, with $100, bucks, nobody gets excited. It's not a big enough thing to argue about. They just give them the credit. I think we've sold every house that we've ever sold, with the exception of maybe three or four on lease options. It just works so well. It's just a fun thing to do. You know, I like to negotiate, right? Well, you negotiate. You know, you're dealing directly with a, with a buyer. There's no agent involved, so I get to do all the talking. It's just fun. I like doing it.